Okay, great. So welcome. Um, I will uh, try to do an org mode presentation. So I will share my screen. Um, here, I hope you can now see a, um, an Emacs buffer with a paper title at the top. Um, so this is about a, a paper that I've been submitting to JFP just before vacation. And it's about equality in dependent type programming. And um, um, there's a preprint available on archive. So, and I think I've opened that. Oh yeah, oh. <laughs> this is an interesting coincidence. This day, exactly five years ago, was the inauguration lecture for me as a full professor. My mother sent me a, a link to Facebook pictures. So <laughs> anyway, the, the, the paper, uh, Extension and Equality Preservation and Verified Generic Programming, um, is available on, on archive as a preprint. Um, and of course, there's like 24 pages of, of uh, examples. And I will only take small parts of it today. I will not page through it here. Um, the authors are uh, Nicola Botta, who is at the Potsdam Institute of Climate Impact Research and a joint associate professor at Chalmers. I think some of you met him at the winter meeting or something else, somewhere else. And his postdoc, uh, Nuria Brede, also at Vikten, uh, and also Tim Richter, who's working at Potsdam University and uh, who's interested in uh, functional programming and independent type programming in both Idris, Agda and so on. So uh, just before we get into the actual meat of the paper, um, I'd like to give some general background. So um, we've had over 10 years of collaboration between Chalmers and this uh, Potsdam Institute of Climate Impact Research, including three different EU projects. And um, it's an Institute of Climate Impact Research, which might sound a bit different, strange that they're doing functional programming and, and dependent type programming. But uh, for some reason, there has been a, a little pocket of interesting people there. So Cesar Ionesco was there many years and did his PhD. And then he was a postdoc here and then in Oxford and now he's in Germany. And Nicola Botta has been there all over all these years. Nicola is actually from the start. Um, complex computational fluid dynamics person. So a person writing uh, schemes for uh, implementing partial differential equations and so on, which is of course clear why that might be useful for climate and so on. I mean, the, the flow of oceans and air and so on. But he's ended up doing uh, verified uh, functional programming in most Idris for the last few years. And I've been doing high level modeling with these guys, economy, mod uh, vulnerability, policies, sequential decision problems. I've talked about that a few times before. Um, background for this particular paper are some practical proofs of monadic programs, uh, which are then parts of the specification of some sequential decision problems, where we noted that it was not quite clear um, what the laws should be for monads and so on uh, in the details. And we traced that back and analyzed it and the questions about type class laws. Um, so I will not really talk about the examples much here. Uh, there is actually another companion paper as well, which I'm not a co-author on, uh, which goes into details there, which is also on archive if you're interested. I should also mention as part of this background that at any point you can uh, try to ask questions. Um, I'm not sure if I see if you raise your hand, but maybe you will see it and notifies me or something. Okay, then um, let's get into the sort of overview of what the paper is about. So first, as extensional equality is a core topic here, let's define it. So I'm using a notation here where, where there are these, these bars around code snippets. And that's um, because uh, this is taken, cut out of the paper where we use LHS to Tesh to convert from uh, Idris code to uh, LaTeX. 
So um, here it's, you got a raw material, so I hope you can read it reasonably easily. But f and g are two functions from a to b, and they are extensionally equal when fx equals gx for all x. And um, you can define this equality uh, in Idris and Agda and other dependent type languages. And this, uh, in Idris, this is a syntax. So the first is a type of it, taking these two functions to a type. So equality itself is a type, uh, the way of coding up propositions as empty or non-empty types. And this is the implicit for all quantification. So it's a for all x in A, fx equals gx. And um, note then the definition of this pointwise equality. I got this little point in the middle here to denote um, that it's extensional equality, which I sometimes call pointwise equality, that it depends on another equality, which is this built-in equality. Uh, I should also remark that the function here are simply typed functions a to b, but that's not essential. I mean, we could also have b depend on the value of a, it just adds a bit of clutter here. So I'm trying to keep uh, the concepts uh, simpler. So let's get into an example. So the example from the abstract of the paper is, is map for lists. So map takes a function from A to B to a function from list A to list B. And uh, if F and G are extensionally equal, then so will map F and map G B. So that's uh, an example of equality preservation where you got the same kind of equality here as you get in the result. Um, you could have different equalities, but we're trying to avoid what is sometimes called setoid hell, which is when you, you make sure that all your types come with an equality or an equivalence relation. Uh, it becomes rather complicated. It's a nice and clean and cute theory and that there's a category of setoids and so on. And there are all kinds of levels there, but um, you very easily get into functions with seven parameters and, and um, it is a bit of a slippery slope. So we're trying to avoid that by just to keeping to um, one equality, which is extensional equality. But to explain why this is the case, I have to uh, get into a bit about different flavors of equality next. So first to quote, um, well, equality, all animals are equal. Some animals are more equal than others. Um, and uh, this is true then for all of these different programming languages. There are different ways of talking about equality and different strengths of these equalities. Um, there is the, the typical Boolean equality, which is not the topic of the talk, but just to compare and get a little more of the syntax of Idris. Idris, as Haskell, has an equality operator, two equal signs. Um, it's parameterized over a type and it's in the EQ class and its type is then A to A to bool for um, types A which are in this class. The classes are called uh, interfaces in Idris, but I'll I use the class uh, terminology here because I'm more used to it. Notice that this is an ad hoc equality. The, the implementer, the programmer can put whatever function they want with the right type in there. And uh, it doesn't really um, need to satisfy any laws. And you can, of course, in a dependent type language, add laws to the type class and require it and so on. But that's not the topic of this talk, just so that we calibrate where we are. The topic in, in on the other end is this type level equality. So um, the, on the base level, there is the intentional equality. Uh, in Agda and Idris and so on, it's defined as an inductive family of types. It's written in fix, so A and B, if they are terms, then A equals B is a type. Uh, it only has one constructor, REFL, and that constructor is only available for the sort of diagonal case of this two argument family. The family is A and B as parameters, and if A and B are actually the same, so A equals A, then there is a REFL constructor, a one constructor data type, so like the unit type. And in all other cases, it's an empty type. Um, and if this was all, they would be a bit boring. Uh, but fortunately, um, there is lots of reduction happening. I mean, if, if syntactic equality was all, it would be very boring. 
So there's some power that comes here from, from reduction. So actually, REFL is a proof of E A equals B if A and B are reduced to identical expressions and reduced under which rewrites. Well, there is alpha conversion, as always, capture theory, renaming of bound variables. There's beta reduction. If you have a, a lambda expression applied to an argument, then the argument is substituted in and so on. And also eta reduction. I wasn't sure that this was in, but I just tried it uh, when writing this paper, that the function f is considered equal to the lambda expression x to f of x. This, by the way, is not a law in Haskell. So due to bottoms and so on, if f is bottom, this right-hand side is actually more defined than the left-hand side. But as both Idris and Agda are about strong functional programming, where termination is, is um, put elsewhere, this is actually a, a law, a built-in reduction. Uh, and the most strength here is added by the user-defined equations. So the typical example there for natural numbers, uh, if we get natural numbers in the usual boring piano style with zero and successor, and you define addition by pattern matching on the first argument, we get things like REFL is a proof of one plus one equals two. So this is the concrete entry is syntax for it. And if we have a variable n of type nut, we have that REFL is a proof of zero plus n equals n, because that's one case that's a user defined equation, but we do not have REFL is of type n plus zero equals n, unless we define a plus with pattern matching on the second argument, in which case the first one fails. So you get one or the other uh, for the standard definitions of, of natural numbers as a, an, as a recursive data type. Uh, it's not the case that, well, it is the case that both these hold, uh, they are both um, inhabited, it's just that REFL is not the proof. We can prove the proof by induction, of this second one. Anyway, so that's uh, one of the classical examples of um, what you can do. So this, this, uh, the fact that you can do some equalities sort of under lambda, or it feels like it's under lambda, um, is makes this pretty strong, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't do everything. And we'll get into some example later, but it doesn't quite work as you want. So preservation of equality. Well, we got, we're we going to go through four definitions of what equality preservation might mean. And uh, first, um, if we just look at what it could mean generally, it should be a property of functions. So a function age from A to B preserves equality in one argument if X equal Y implies age of X equals age of Y. And then here I've written the equality sign, which is in Idris means the intentional built-in equality and with that equality, this always holds. So all functions you can define satisfy this. And that it's, it's a bit interesting because, I mean, as we see so before, there the are lots of things uh, which are evaluated. So x equal y could be a rather big, x and y can be big expressions which actually happen to evaluate the same. And then we automatically get that any functions like the factorial function or whatever of x and y would also be the same even though the computation would be take a lot of time to do it, it doesn't need to do the computation. So this is the key property of, of the built-in uh, intentional equality, congruence. And it can be coded up as a little helper function for doing proofs. So this is uh, using a hidden argument syntax here. So we got two types, the function age as a hidden argument and two values, a and a prime of type a, and then if a equals a prime, so if there is a proof of this, then we can also prove h of a is equal to h of a prime. And as we have pattern matching, we also only need to pattern match on this equality proof, which will make a and a prime in the proof checker be both a, which means that this is h of a, h applied to a and h applied to a again, which is also the syntactically the same, so that is proven by reflectivity. So this is nice, also perhaps a bit boring. Um, when we look at um, more complicated functions, it's not always the case that we can, that we have 
intentional equality. You might have a weaker equality, which in, we could get to extensional equality later. But first, let's try to generalize it. So if we want to look at preservation or maybe transport of equality, um, it's a property of a function and two equalities. So again, it's a function age. And if f is equal to g with some equality, equality one, then h of f should be equal to h of g with equality two. So if we have two equalities as parameters here, then preservation of equality probably means that we should take equal arguments to equal results. Uh, this is the nice part of the path that descends into setoid hell. Um, and you can build up all these things and you can code it up in, in Idris or Agda and so on. Uh, it, gets messy, especially when you, you start getting more uh, like functors and so on. And we'll get some example of that later. Uh, and this is not the path we'll take. So we'll take a step back here and see what we can do if we go a little less ambitious and specialize first the first equality to pointwise equality. So extensional equality of functions. So perhaps. Uh, Pause briefly and see if there are any questions. Okay, let's move on. Actually, I can't see the participant list here, but now I can. I should put that on my other screen. Okay, um, so version three, we specialize the first equality to extensional pointwise equality. And then we get the function age from a function type to C. So this is, for example, map could be age. Then C would also be a function type, but it would fit this pattern. So this precise equality, if f extensionally equal to G, implies this. Um, what equality should we pick for the equality two? Well, let's be symmetric and really preserve equality and not just transform it and uh, use the same equality again. And then we get the final version that we will talk about further down. So if we have a function age from a function type to a function type, that one preserves extensional equality. If f pointwise equals g implies h of f pointwise equals h of g. So this would be also boring if this always held, but that's not the case. So let's take a trivial example, const. Let's try to see both. Uh, oh, yes. So the function const um, for age here, well, it can take a function in. So we have f and g, which are extensionally equal. In, and we want to prove that age of f, so const of f is extensionally equal to const of g. Well, if we expand the definition, that says for all x, const of f of x should be equal to const of g of x. And this equality now is the built-in intentional equality. So const, of course, is a simple function returning f or g here. So this is just f equals g. But here we have only known that f is extensionally equal to g, which does not mean that it's actually intentionally equal. So for all x is sort of meaningless here <laughs> because x is not used anymore. But const f is actually not extensionally equal to const g, even though f is equal, extensionally equal to g. Unless, of course, f is actually intentionally equal to g, which is stronger. So this is an example then of, of a, a function that, that uh, fails to preserve uh, extensional equality. And uh, well, you could say it fails for a silly reason. You should really have another equality here on the right hand side. And um, well, maybe you should, and then you get into this um, setoid hell. So let's see where we get to if we if we stick to extensional equality. So um, the next example, which is uh, is function composition, that's also a non-example. So it also does not satisfy extensional equality preservation in one argument, and I have tried to write out some of the steps here. But it's basically the same kind of problem as for const. You get to an equality between, you get to an intentional equality between two functions, and you cannot go under lambda. Uh, you cannot go in and 
check that f is actually extensionally equal to g. We do have, if we go one level down, we can say that the left-hand side applied to x is equal to the right-hand side applied to x. So we have sort of a two level down equality. So if we would um, use this extensional equality generic version with equality two is a two level extensional equality, then it would hold. So we sort of need to keep track of which equalities we use at which level. Um, this is sort of a special case as well. So, and, and that's not why we're, we ended up in trouble later. It was monadic cases. But it's, it's interesting to see already these very simple functions like constant function compositions get into trouble here. Uh, as a side note, uh, extensional equality preservation for two arguments holds. So if f and f prime are extensionally equal, g and g prime are extensionally equal, then f composed g is extensionally equal to f prime composed uh, g prime. So uh, <clears throat> As you can see here, there are lots of different variants that you can use for so two arguments. Um, you can have uh, extensional equality with two quantifications and so on. Um, so this is just to show that uh, one has to be a bit careful with the exact uh, notion of equality. Um, let's see. No questions there. Okay. Um, yes, I, I could show Xify. So. Um, the extensional equality, the point-wise equality here that I mentioned earlier, that's sort of a lifted version, a one argument lifted version of intentional equality. And in generally, generally speaking, if you have any equivalence relation, um, relation B here, you can lift that to work on functions. Um, and you can use a combinator that I call Xify. And then our point-wise equality is Xify of the intentional equality. I don't know why the highlighting is strange here. Um, and then we can extify the pointwise equality, or oh, this, this was the wrong notation, sorry. So if we want to have equality which quantifies over two uh, arguments, then we could introduce another operator and so on. So we could extify several steps, and that could be useful in certain cases. Okay, this was um, the overview of uh, pres preservation. Let's uh, try to close this one. The key properties and equality preservation. Um, now to type classes. Um, so type classes naturally come with laws and uh, we will look at classes like functor and monad later. We also mentioned equality earlier. Um, when we have Idris or Agda, we can add those laws as methods. So proof objects that are required to be there for an instance to actually be a lawful instance of the functor or monad class. And um, it um, means then, of course, that if somebody would provide an instance declaration, they will actually have to prove these things, which could be a bit messy. Um, but if we really want to know if, if some of the laws uh, actually holds, then we should try to be careful there. In Idris, for example, the standard library has both the functor class and the very functor class, where very is for verified and also monad and very monad. So you can choose if you want to go for the sort of trust me, there are laws, but we don't want to provide the proofs, the functor class or the very functor class where the laws are required and the instance declaration has to provide them. But as we saw above, or perhaps hinted at above, the devils in the details, uh, we think after having explored this a bit that extensional equality preservation in this form of uh, this form, um, taking extensional equality to extensional equality, is a useful guiding principle here for, for some of these laws. And uh, that it's some we get often into trouble if we want to use intentional equality instead. So uh, that's what the paper is about, and then that does also the talk. Um, it's not about the algorithmic content of the functional extensional principles. It's not about formalizing setoids. It's not about homotopy type theory, cubical type theory, univalence, and so on. 
which is definitely a very promising direction. And if these things get sorted out properly and end up in useful uh, languages that we all love and care for, then maybe we, this whole paper is going to be um, a moot point and not needed anymore. But um, until then, uh, we want to explore what the programmatic approach to generic programming, generic programming in the sense of basically type class programming here, verified generic programming. Okay. Um, Motivating example. So this is uh, a short version. So um, I want to show an example of uh, dynamical systems and I want to get to monadic dynamical systems. But I start out with um, just non-monadic systems just to uh, have it a bit simpler. So a uh, dynamical system has a state space X and the system is basically characterized by its step function f from x to x. So um, then we might want to calculate the nth iterate, also called flow. And that's usually in mathematics just using the exponentiation notation. So f to the power of zero is taking zero step, that's the identity function. And if you want to go n plus one steps, it's f composed f to the power of n or perhaps it should be f to the power of n composed to f. It's uh, possible to use either definition. That's this is fitted on the screen before I increase the font size. But it's uh, not a priori obvious if these two definitions using this right hand side or this right hand side are actually equal. So let's see, are they equal? And uh, what equality should be used for checking that equality? So here we check if they're intentionally equal. And um, just to be a little more concrete, the, the math definition above gets to these two definitions in uh, Idris. So this uh, for any type x and the step function x, f of type x to x, it's zero and successor. And this is using the composition on the left. And this is using the recursion on the right of the composition. So um, now is the question, are these equal or other can be proved in Idris that they are equal. And the statement here is then, um, I should break a line, whoops. So is flow left of f of n equal to flow r of f and n for all f and n? So intentional equality here. And the proof is omitted here, it's in the paper and it's easy. Um, and this I'm using as an example before going to the monad case because we can show here um, a little bit of summary of uh, the different levels of equality we have. So to be a little more concrete here, let's say that E1 is the left-hand side and E2 is the right-hand side. Actually, no, it's obvious. For some reason, I define it the opposite way, but anyway. Um, we can prove that E1 is equal to E2, intentionally equal, for all F and N. And this, as I mentioned, will fail in the monadic version. Uh, but we can also note that E1 and, and E2 are both functions themselves. So they are functions from type of type X to X. So we also have that E1 applied to X is equal to E2 of applied to X. And that follows from uh, I mean, intentional equality preserves all functions. So the function applied to x also satisfies, uh, it preserves intentional equality. Um, in the other direction, if you want to sort of uh, use pointwise equality here, so we can notice that this is for all f and all n. So n is the last quantified variable. So this is pointwise, flow r of f is pointwise equal to flow l of f for all f. And then we could say that actually flow r is point point wise equal to flow l. So um, whoops, um, if we want to use the different notations, we can get into a rather short definition of what this equals. Um, now let's move to the monadic systems and see what we get into trouble in with. So uh, first, uh, the, the main change here to a monadic system is that the, the step function f goes from x to m of x, where m is some monad. 
And typical examples from the applications that we have been studying are lists, so handling non-deterministic systems, or simple probabilities, so a list of pairs of probabilities and values, which are called stochastics or pro probabilistic systems. And um, then to combine, to iterate this function, then instead of normal function composition, we use Kleisley composition. So uh, here is the flow L in the monadic version, flow mon L. So in the same way as before, it takes an, a step function and a natural number and it applies a step function that composes a step function with itself that number of times. And before we had id, now we get pure. Before we had function composition, now we get um, Kleisley composition. So, and, and flow mon r is of course similar, just these two terms are, are swapped here. Um, note now that this is using a type class. So, uh, we, and we would like to have a generic proof. We would like to have a proof of that flow mon l is equal to flow mon r um, without knowing which monad m we, we have. So not having to delay it until we have a specific, say, list monad or so on. But that would require that the monad class has some laws in it. Otherwise, we know nothing about them. So we need some kind of specification of monad operations. And um, what happened here? OK, let's. Um, so of course, lots of laws about monads can be found in category theory books. and. Um, their equality is used freely and uh, widely, but um, it's not obvious what equality they should use here. And we try to instantiate the equality with the pointwise extension of equality. So for example, here is, is one specification that is common for Kleisley composition. So Kleisley composition of F and G, F is a function from A to MB, then we can map G with a function, which is a function from B to MC, over this M, and then we get an M of M of C, and then we can join them up to get from M of M of C to M of C. And um, these two should be equal, but the question here is what equality? And as I said, well, let's go with the extensional equality. So this is then the specification that we can add to the monad class or add as a, a assumption somewhere in our files. So F and G have these types, and then we require that F closely composed with G should be extensionally equal to join function composition map G function composition F. So the, the, you can see that the direction of function composition is the opposite here. I mean, the input comes from this direction and goes in that way. So this arrow sort of maybe should be flipped. But there is also the other combinator, the the flipped arrow combinator. Um, so this is uh, a specification we could use, and then we we'll see where we go with this. So first, let's see what the monadic flow computation law um, becomes. So now we have the same law as before, that the left version should be equal to the right version with this modification that we use pointwise equality or extensional equality in the middle. Why? Well, because it fails if we use um, intentional equality. Or if we want a little bit more precise, if we want the law to hold on the spot with the real intentional equality here, not pointwise, then we have to make the laws in the very monad class so strong that basically there are no monads. I mean, the identity monad is still a monad, but uh, several monads fall out, and that's bits annoying. And extensional equality seems to work reasonably fine, so we, we aim for that one. So this is a, sort of the motivating example, or a sort of very simplified version of the motivating example from the other paper that uh, we need to look at, into laws, monad laws and functor laws and so on using extensional equality. Um, so let's close this one down. <clears throat> so what do these verified functors and monads look like? So first, the very functor, so verified functors. Um, the first version here, I'm not sure if the font size is big enough. If 
anybody complains, I can increase it. Okay. So uh, usually the functor interface only contains map. So the function a to b to f of a to f of b. But if you want to keep the, the standard preservation laws, then we want to preserve identity and we want to preserve composition. And note that we say here that map id extensionally equals id. Uh, this is a, an Idris uh, help for, for Idris because he doesn't realize that id should be at the type f of a. So id of type f of a to f of a is the, the right hand side here. So it's a, it's a hidden argument supplied to, to id. And then composition preservation says then that the extensional equality of map g composed f to id, map g composed map f. So it's a little weaker than uh, intentional equality, but it makes it easy to implement, um, easier to implement. Um, so this still is not quite the thing we want to use because we also need to preserve extensional equality. So here we added one new, um, let's see if I can make a little arrow there. This line is new. Um, we have added in the same vein as extensional equality here, um, used extensional equality requiring that if f extensionally equals g, then map f extensionally should equal map g. Uh, this also turns out to be easy, easy to implement for typical container data types like lists and trees and so on. But we will not get everything. It does not work for functors with built-in function types. So if you've got state or reader or so on, then the equality will require inside there will require another level of the XDFI application. So they might, you might need two dots over the arrow here. And we have not explored the full details here because it will um, get into trouble. And that's what I want to give an example of here. So what about setoids? Wouldn't that support everything, including state and reader and so on? And uh, I want to indicate what the problem is here. So the thing is that with setoids, uh, you have all types come with an equality. And let's see what equalities we have here. So we have four types. I mean, we have, we have the, the A that should have an equality. We have B that should have an equality. We have F of A. Now we have up to three equalities. F of B, that's a four. And then we could parameterize over this equality. Uh, it's not obvious we should use extensional equality there, we could have, we could parameterize on the equality of arrows on the left-hand side and the equality on arrows on the right-hand side. So at this point, we got six equalities. And also the quantification will matter. So do we quantify over all arrows or only arrows which satisfy the underlying equality? Because for example, the equality here um, should that equality preserve the equality from A to B? And uh, how should we go that up? And to what level of detail? So this, this can all be coded up and has been coded up in category theory formulations in Agda, for example. There are libraries on the web, uh, but it gets a bit heavy. And uh, you get easily seven or eight or 10 hidden arguments uh, of different equalities to have to keep track of. So uh, our attempt here is to just stay clear of that and, and see what happens if we focus on just the extensional equality. Um, yeah, this was the hint. Keeping track of at least six notion equality just for functors and then going to monads and so on. <clears throat> so uh, anyway, what, what we use here is the, the, the interface of functors where we've added map preserves extensional equality as another requirement for those who write instances. Okay, let's go to monad. Um, first, the traditional category theory. Uh, this is the category theory view of it. We got eta and mu. Uh, which is pure and join. And these diagrams are usually the ones that are classifying these operations, how they interact. I will not go into the details because it's not that important right here. Uh, 
these eta and mu should also be natural transformations. Here you can read off their types. So you can see that eta, pure, or return, embeds an A into M of A, or a B into M of B, and it should make this diagram commute. And similarly, uh, mu or join uh, should make this diagram commute. It takes an M of M of A and to an M of A. It sort of crushes together two levels of lists or two levels of reader or two levels of whatever. Um, these can be summed up as laws. Mathematically speaking, this is how they're usually written uh, as compositions of natural transformations. And um, then, of course, what should we do with equality? Well, we will say let's use extension of equality here um, of, um, for, for this equality sign. And if we hide some parts, I think we can open the next and still keep the laws. Yes. So <clears throat> this is an Idris um, version of this. And uh, this is, well, the traditional category theoretic view. Uh, it has only pure and join as operations. That's the eta and, and mu. And then it has these five uh, laws. Um, and now we've implemented the equality sign here by the dot equality, so the extension of equality. And they also have to help Idris here in two places about the types. Um, so this is one way uh, of doing it, but this only has these two operations and, and functional programmers usually like to work with other operations like bind and Claisley composition and so on. And then we have to add those and the exact definitions of those will matter. So one way we could say, oh, maybe we don't want to um, have them have them fixed in the library and we want to make them possible to change by the user. And then we get to what we call the fat A to T view or the abstract data type view. And here we've added pure, in addition to pure and join, we also have bind and Claisley composition. And then in addition to the five laws, we have to relate these operators. So this is, this is a typical um, case where you have a, 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 a little, um, DSL, and then you add some derived operations. And very often in Haskell as well, like for equality, you got equality and non-equal. Uh, they're both in, but they're supposed to satisfy uh, a default definitions as one. And you can see this, this uh, specification is a bit like default definitions. So here, for example, we say that if you bind to F, it should be the same as join, join after map. And the, the specification of uh, Kleisley composition that we, that we saw earlier. Um, it becomes a little wide and of course we could also introduce even more operations. Uh, that's not the, the point here of finding the exact right point of uh, this choice, but it's just showing the different versions. Um, you also are probably familiar with the, the Waddle review when you have only pure and bind. Um, there's a certain economy in this, there are fewer laws, um, but it's not, when you try to do this equality preservation business, it turns out that actually these laws, uh, which I haven't seen the, well, written down exactly in this way, and it is perhaps because it's a bit inconvenient, um, they are not enough, it turns out. So they, we also need uh, that lifting preserves extensional equality. I will not go into the details of this here in the uh, interest of time, but, um, you can also see that the law here becomes rather ugly. And that's partly because the, the bind operator, while convenient for, for uh, functional programming, it doesn't really fit very well with the laws. As you see, this is a lambda expression equal to a lambda expression, including a lambda expression. Um, not what I would consider a, a cute version of it. It, it looks a little better if you, in, if you use the, the function lift, which is part of the typical Waddler view. But then the question, should you add that to make a sort of semi-fat monad, the monad four, and another specification of that? Or yeah, exactly what level of detail is not obvious. Uh, so we actually go with the, the fat view um, in the rest of the, of the paper, just also to see how problematic is having specifications in here. So it's not problematic for the instances, but it's uh, the difference here of specifying these 
instead of having them outside of the class and defining them as derived operators, is that here you really have to explicitly call bind join map spec in your proofs. If this would be a definition, this is equal to, intentionally equal to this one, then Idris or Agda would automatically evaluate, uh, reduce using those equalities. So it's a trade-off, choosing to have them specified in a fat interface or having them defined outside. And we, we opted for the one here with specification because it's a little more conservative in the sense that um, if we have to make the proofs a little more complicated, it might still be good because we might be able to support more monads in the other end. So the main lesson learned um, is that equalities matter and extensional equality preservation is useful. Um, equalities matter in unfortunate detail. As we saw before, it really matters exactly where you use a dot equal or a dot dot equal or one equal or the others. So the, the question which when I started as a, as a master's student already, that uh, was um, Bengt Nordström's favorite question on the talk was a, what equality is that? He would point to a certain slide or so. And then that, that, equality, that question is usually a very good question for almost all equalities in, in, in papers which have some combination of theory and, and practice. Because as I mentioned, some equalities don't hold in Haskell, uh, some equalities you can't prove in Idris or Agda and so on. Um, in the, this is sort of a pragmatic middle road when we try to use extensional equality in several places instead of parameterizing over all the equalities. Um, it's a bit difficult to take other middle roads to parameterize on some of the equalities because you also need to make sure that the, these equalities are preserved by the right, correct operations. So you easily get a, a whole um, selection of more operations that you need to add to the interfaces. Uh, so the rest of the paper, that's ma mainly uh, so that you know what you could find if you want to read it. It goes back to the dynamical systems and some control theory examples and uh, makes those proofs using these um, extensional equality versions, in this case, the FAT ADT view of the monads. Um, we also go through the related work on, on setoids and, and uh, um, as I said, cubicle and so on. And there is work in code. There is as much more code in the paper than Idris talk uh, of uh, Idris code that, that works. And I should flip back so that you see just a flash of, of the examples. Um, so we have this uh, equality chains um, in several places where we really prove the equalities. And it's using the equality chain notation of Agda, or Idris, which is basically the same notation as in, in Agda. So you have a term, the reason for why it's equal, and then the next term, the reason why it's equal. And it's, it mimics the equality notation in the usual handwritten equality proofs, but it's fully uh, checked by the computer. So um, if, if it doesn't load in Idris, then there's something wrong somewhere. And that keeps you honest. It, as I, if I go to this applications side, you might see the the kind of um, I wanted to get here. Yeah, so we give some examples of where you end up into trouble uh, with, for example, this model review, the lambda expressions there, and um, the kind of proofs that you need to. Let's see what that is. Sorry, yeah, representation theorems and so on for, for these monadic systems. Um, they become a little bit um, tedious in the sense of lots of detail, but every time we write REFL here, those steps are only for the reader. The, as this is actually evaluates the same as that, which evaluates the same as this, that means that from the other's point of view, we could skip all the steps which are REFL, it would just be a little bit more difficult to follow the proof in that case. Okay, um, that was all. Thanks for listening. Um, questions? Thank you very much, Patrick. So let's open up for questions. So Patrick, there was something on one of your earlier slides that prompted um, 
thoughts uh, for me. So you explained um, that the way the type checker works is that it's using Lambda, calculus reductions, and user-provided rules to reduce mm -hmm. expressions. Yeah. But by user-provided rules, what you mean is the kind of equations that are the definition of a function, right? Yep. Like uh, zero plus x equals x. That's yes. a typical um, case. Yes. So that made me wonder whether um, one could use a, a wider set of rewrite rules. I mean, suppose you had a confluent and terminating set of rewrite rules, mm. which might perhaps include the monad laws. Oh, uh, yes. Okay. I wonder if that could be used as the basis for a dependently typed programming language and whether it would, um, you know, finesse some of these issues. Well, so we use monads here as an example because that we ran into problems, but I, I don't think it's, it, it sounds a bit ad hoc to build in monads specifically. But in general, I mean, reasoning modular theories, I'm, I'm sure that's very useful. And uh, what is not obvious is the interactions between the built-in reductions that uh, Idris and Agda and so on already have and how to add user-defined uh, um, equations in a good way or, or other reductions in a good way. Yes, I've just been reading about Knuth Bendix completion recently. Mm. And you can imagine that perhaps uh, one could give a collection of equations. And I'm just saying the monad laws would be an example of equations that you might want to give mm. and apply the completion algorithm to them. And of yeah. course, in some cases that doesn't work, but uh, in cases where it does work, mm. well, I just wonder whether it might mm. you know, make, make for a rather usable dependently typed language. Yes, I, I'm, 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 uh, I think there are examples uh, of, of proof systems where they're doing uh, different ways of adding um, different reasoning levels. And um, I just don't know the details, but I'm, I'm sure that there are lots of trade-offs there on what's, what's useful or not. But, uh, mm. Yeah. Any other questions? I see that um, Anna. Oh, yes, Anna and... Uh, yeah. So, Patrick. Yes. Uh, maybe you said it at the beginning, but um, can you explain uh, the choice of uh, your improver? You use Idris instead of Aga, but uh, allowed. <laughs> but I mean, is there any particular reason or can you explain on that? Is, is it better for this um, application or was just you needed to choose one? Uh, the re reason is uh, this. I think there's uh, a few thousand lines of codes in Idris for all kinds of uh, stuff that uh, Nicola has been writing for the last eight years. Um, so that's why. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm a bit tired of Idris at this point. Um, <laughs> So the thing is that, that Idris 1 has some bugs and they won't be fixed because Idris 2 is, is sort of, has been born. And Idris 2 doesn't, it's not quite the same theory as Idris 1. So you basically have to re-implement everything. Um, not everything, of course, but uh, it's a fair amount has to be redone. Um, so basically the answer here is Idris libs a legacy code. I would do it in Agda. Okay, thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. This is Warwick, by the way, sorry. Um, okay. But yeah, so I was wondering on the dynamical systems, like what, I know that you said you expand on that detail in the paper and you didn't do it in the talk, but which mm -hmm. motivating like physical examples were you were you thinking about? And then also um, like would a value, because when you're working with the dynamical system, you're constantly reevaluating the function like as you go along and then because the noise will come in the system and then you have to somehow account for the noise. And so does the evaluation order 
play a role in this rather than just the function definition? I'm a little bit confused as to that detail. Yes. Um, so, so the, the concrete sort of the, the companion paper that um, Nikolai and, and his postdoc Nuria, they were writing um, that sort of led into this, this other paper being written um, is about finite horizon monadic sequential decision problems. Um, and uh, so it's typical case that they are motivating examples they have are things for, for climate uh, change and, and tipping points in the climate system and, and things like that. So of course, there are very, very simplified models of it, but they, um, uh, they use um, often than prob probabilistic or uh, non-deterministic uh, functions that trans transport from one state to the next. And um, the definitely evaluation is a problem in the pragmatic side of actually running this this code. So if you want to, you 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 really want to uh, simulate these systems and see what different policies uh, could give us choices and results and so on, then you have to run efficient code somewhere. But that's not really what they've been focusing on. They were trying to focus on, can we specify the correctness and prove the correctness given that there is an implementation that works? Because there are other problems as well, because usually you would like to, to work with uh, actual doubles in the computer and not rational numbers or other exact real number arithmetics. So of course, there also could be um, things which are not exactly true. And um, those issues are not attacked in these frameworks. Uh, they still think, uh, so th this is part of the EU project that Nikolai is, uh, has the one work package in. Uh, so they still, from the climate side, seem to think it's reasonable, at least this project was funded. Um, but uh, the, the question of to what degree you can be certain of the correctness of a system, even if you have proved it correct in the ideal formulation is of course a very valid question. I don't know about evaluation order if that is a problem here. Um, and then just another uh, appendage to that question is like what um, would the wouldn't you want if you were talking about an equality of an or of a dynamical system some kind of notion of like equality and convergence or like some like you would want some probabilistic or weaker notion of equality because there's no mm. obviously exact equality when we're doing physical me measurements of things. Yes. So, so in the, in the applications where you actually do, um, um, so that maybe is actually the other paper, um, which I think can be seen here. There, there is a, oh no, it's probably, I need to, show here so so the well i don't need to show the details but the thing is that uh, when you iterate uh, you use a measure um, to uh, reduce the probability i mean basically the join you want to get down to uh, after we got the monadic result you want to get down to a value that you can decide if that's better or worse than one you have to compare different uh, trajectories and so on so you have to measure the results i think the measure is rather early um, that that's what's not visible in this the paper I've, I've shown today but um, gosh, I think monad states reward function uncertainty measure yes so it's so you have to get out of the monad somewhere so you get a, a, a monadic result of some values and then you have to get one value out to be able to do numeric comparison or similar some kind of comparison of, of uh, like the greenhouse gas emissions of one with the, the other one. And that's usually for probabilistic systems, that's the expected value. And then uh, you could uh, argue that maybe if, if it's only changes in the fifth decimal, then it doesn't matter. So you can then weaken your equality to, to um, not take into account uh, smaller than a certain epsilon that mathematically doesn't have so nice properties, 
for example, if you add up lots of very, very small errors, you tend to get a big error after a while. So um, it is a bit messy uh, when you want to get, if you want to get exact results from a probabilistic, probabilistic system, uh, what happens sometimes is they get probabilistic results from probabilistic systems. And that is not supported by this, this theory here, but they're at, at PIC they got another group who's working on, on what they call sort of two level probabilities. So um, if you get an error bar on, on some result, what is the probability that those error bars are actually correct? It seems messy, but um, it, it is a relevant question and that's something that's not addressed by our work, neither this paper that I've talked about today or the companion paper, but it is an important question and uh, some pragmatics I think is needed because as you might imagine, if you calculate all the trajectories from a certain starting point and you really care for all possibilities, then it will be unintractable because there might be a minute probability that something completely disastrous happens. And, and that will have to be evaluated with extreme precision. So you will, you will have to make some kind of um, cutoff, either in probability or in, uh, in time, and, and just handle those extreme cases in other ways. But it's, it's definitely a good question. Thank you. Any other? We're getting fewer and fewer here, so. <laughs> and so I'm just wondering along the lines of what you were just discussing, I mean, you, you were mentioning floating point. And uh, I know that it, when one writes floating point programs, it is very, very easy to screw up and write code that for real numbers would be correct, but uh, numerically is very bad. So that's, that's one place where um, uh, program verification could be really useful, right? If you could verify that actually this floating point code that you've written is going to behave well. Hmm. Um, but I don't know enough about it to know how you, how you determine whether or not it will play well. I'm just wondering whether, whether there are, are Agda or Idris libraries that enable you to write numerical code that, um, that computes accurate answers. Uh, not uh, not um, with floating points specifically, but tr trying to get around that, what we've done is, is there is a part of this Idris Libs is dealing with interval arithmetics. So um, if, you're, if you're using conservative in intervals with the endpoints being doubles, they can be computed reasonably quickly and you can get sort of exact, and well, exact in the meaning, conservative results. You can get an interval within which the definition, the, the answer definitely lies. The problem there as well is if you get this small probability with large, uh, large harms, uh, that the, the interval you would tend, up, tend to get at the end without cutoff and so on would be like, well, it's somewhere on the real line. Right, yes. So, yeah, I wonder uh, how, how, how numerical programmers in practice reason about uh, the accuracy of their code and you know, whether that yeah, kind of I, informal I, reason could be captured nicely in a library. <laughs> I don't know, but uh, I saw very recently, just a few days ago, somebody posted a, a tool which helps you rewrite your numerical expressions in the, the form that has probably less uh, um, compla computational complexity, but still within the same error bound or something like that. Hmm. Uh, there was uh, something passed by on Twitter the other day. It's not something we've been working on. Right, yeah. I have seen the occasional paper on analyzing or rewriting numerical programs to improve accuracy. Mm. Interesting idea. Mm. Okay. I should mention also when, when John is talking, I think about testing and, and uh, these, these things like uh, for all x, uh, f of x equals g of x, that's of course, that's what you do when you, well, of course, a part of that is what you do when you do quick check. Uh, so I, I think I haven't explored it in this paper, but I think there are a number of things which are interesting in uh, how you code up this into in these um, axioms or laws for your monads and functors and so on in such a way that they are also quick check testable in a mm. useful way. And uh, there you get the same kind of problems with implications and, 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 uh, and so on, even though of course it, it becomes even worse because you then you don't know if it's if it holds because you're going to test a finite number of cases. But in practice, my feeling is that it it's usually works quite well. 
but uh, you get this case of generating things which are uh, if you get the if you do the setoid version you will have to start generating lots of equality relations and so on and that gets very messy so that might be good to stick to extension of equality yes oh, i see that nice okay any final questions we are six minutes over yes so maybe it's better to head to next meeting yes okay Thanks, Thanks for so coming. Thank you. Bye.